This week, the Fed uh, unanimously raised rates by 25 basis points, uh, as we sort of mentioned earlier. Uh, and I've pulled a few comments from Jerome Powell's statement and then got a little bit from the Q&A. And then I'll, I'll pass it back to you, Steve, for any thoughts that you have. But uh, here's, uh, here's the first comment that I pulled out. So recent developments are likely to result in tighter credit conditions for households and businesses and to weigh on economic activity, hiring and inflation. The extent of these effects is uncertain. Uh, Chairman Powell went on to say, we no longer state that we anticipate that ongoing rate rises will be appropriate to quell inflation. Instead, we now anticipate some additional policy firming may be appropriate. Uh, so that's a slight changing in the wording there. Um, but he finished with, before recent events, we were clearly on track to continue with ongoing rate hikes. In fact, as of a couple of weeks ago, it looked like we need to raise rates over the course of the year more than we expected at the time of the SEP in the December meeting. So I think there's been a slight sort of changing in, in wording there. Uh, I think Powell at one point uh, previously thought that they were going to have to be a lot more aggressive, which was a bit of a shock to the market on the day, because I think the market tends to think that everything was going fairly fairly well in terms of the, the, the Fed's position. But interesting to see that there was... Uh, uh, a little bit of indecisiveness, I suppose, between uh, between the, the board members and the decision makers. But they've definitely pulled back from that policy now. I think they think that the bank is going to, uh, the banking crisis, if that's what we're going to call it, or whatever it's, it's yet to be named, is going to add some of the uh, sort of credit tightening, uh, tightening pressures that um, in, uh, increasing interest rates does. So. Uh, on to the Q&A. So Powell also does a little bit of a media Q&A afterwards. And I've just got a couple of the questions here and uh, uh, a couple of the answers. So uh, One of the questions to Powell was, given all the stress and uncertainty you also alluded to in the statement, how seriously uh, was a pause considered for this meeting? So Powell just responded and said that we did consider that in the days uh, running up to the meeting. Uh, but... What we didn't have in February and still don't have is a sign of progress in the non-housing services sector. And that is just something that will come through uh, through softening demand and perhaps some softening in labour market conditions. And we don't see that yet. He was asked about Silicon Valley Bank and he responded at a basic level. Silicon Valley Bank's management failed badly. They grew the bank too quickly. They exposed the bank to significant liquidity risk and interest rate risk. And then they didn't hedge that risk. And it's clear we do need to strengthen supervision and regulation in these areas. On rate cuts, he said that um, in that most likely case, participants don't see rate cuts this year. They just don't. So I think that was fairly, uh, fairly clear. Uh, he was asked about protecting depositors. Uh, the question was... Um, basically uh, how he feels about it essentially and he said you've seen we have the tools to protect depositors when there's a threat of serious harm to the economy or the financial system and we're prepared to use these tools depositors should assume that their deposits are safe and then there was a follow-up question that said you've stated twice today that depositor savings and the banking system are safe are you saying that a de facto deposit insurance covers all savings by way of example a bank with under one billion in assets failed are you promising to bail out their depositors too and powell said i'm not saying anything more than what i'm saying uh he was followed up with a question about rate cuts and he said that uh, as i mentioned earlier with rate cuts rate cuts are not in our base case and you know that's all i have to say and with that he was done until next time steve anything Yep, no rate cuts. Big surprise there. I mean, the idea that I said um, in the UK people were thinking about the idea of what maybe they won't increase rates because banking uncertainty at the moment. Uh, we're catching up to the US, right, who are now thinking, well, maybe they're going to bring down rates or something like that. They're not bringing down rates this year, as far as I can tell. And don't rule it out entirely because extraneous things might make anything uh, happen, to be honest. I'm thinking back to your prediction from the start of the year that the US stays out of recession. I think you had you had soft landing, basically, which meant stays out of recession for this year. Yep. That's yeah. My plan. So when I think about that, I now start thinking things like the banking situation, maybe not that specifically, but it does make me kind of realize or just remember, I suppose, exactly how hostage we are in these things to completely extraneous events like 
a banking uh, breakdown, like a war in Ukraine or something like that. The kind of thing that can sort of scupper anyone's predictions for anything. And there's still, what, nine months of the year left to go. Uh, we're an awful long way from being right about these things. Anything that had a year or so to uh, run rather than a kind of one shot event. Um, indecisiveness from the Fed is kind of interesting um, to me. I was listening to a few different sort of takes on interest rates in general. And there's a view that I heard kind of coming to the fore, which is the view that I had at the start of the year. I nicked it. So it's not my thinking, but it was a view that I thought sounded plausible which was, I don't think I want to see the Fed, or I'm not going to get excited by the Fed slowing down rate rises, because if the Fed slows down or stops interest rate rises with inflation at, I don't know where it is, six-ish percent at the moment, that doesn't mean they think they're winning, it means they think they're scared. Um, I don't think this Fed is going to be scared easily, at least not like that. I think this Fed is going to be scared of failing the other way, uh, of, of not doing enough, basically. So the, pro the problem if they come off too early is we get inflation back again and the problem restarts because um, not enough liquidity comes out of the system, too many people still spending. That, I think, is going to be what kind of frightens uh, Powell, the idea that he might stop too soon and fails to tackle the thing he was supposed to be tackling. They've set out their stall to deal with inflation I think now, realistically, they have to deal with it. And they have kind of said, I thought reasonably clearly, come what may, we are taking down the inflation thing, barring something uh, on the scale of a war, uh, potentially. OK, if that happens, then, you know, promises we made about inflation take back seats to promises we kind of also implicitly make about not ruining everything everywhere. But the idea that... Um, the I like the idea, I guess, that the banking sector might do some of the work for the um, Fed by tightening lending requirements and slowing down kind of liquidity that way. But I'm uh, I'm still looking at more rises in my head. Yeah, me too. And I, I was trying to think about this sort of, uh, from a because I like Jerome Powell. So for me, he never really lost his credibility. But I think for a lot of people, he perhaps did or at least slipped down the the scale of credibility. If we're if we're going to say it's not it's not as linear. Um, and I was thinking about in terms of the way Jerome Powell um, communicates to the way that Andrew Bailey communicates in the Bank of England. And I think that Jerome Powell is, I mean, he's, he's evidently a better communicator than Andrew Bailey, and he seems to be a, a little bit more in touch with how the how the kind of world works outside of the, the you know, the central bank. And it got me thinking about Mark Carney as well and how, how good of a communicator he was in, in comparison to Andrew Bailey. And, and I'm sort of wondering to myself how how good of a communicator and do you have to be to be the banker, uh, the, you know, to be a central banker. And I, and, and I think you have to be very, very good. And I wonder if some of the problem we've got with um, runaway inflation and, and you know, the, 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 the tightening that we've done in the UK has not had the same effect that the tightening in the US has done. How much of that has had to do with Bank of England credibility and perhaps that Bailey is just not a very good communicator? Do you have anything on that, Steve? I think being a good communicator is everything in this kind of role. I also think Powell's a really good communicator, and I think quite highly of him. I put the point about credibility slightly different to how you would. Uh, he did very much lose credibility with me, but he's going some way towards getting that back. Uh, I very much lost uh, trust in Powell a bit over the transitory inflation thing, and the fact that we are still talking about inflation kind of indicates he wasn't right about that one. But I also had... Um, inflation to come down quicker so he can be wrong uh, about stuff he's a trump appointee if i'm uh, not mistaken which you know ought to given the way i think about things generally cause me to be negatively disposed towards him but i leaving that thought aside and it's not his particular uh, problem i also think sort of fairly positively about him i think being a good communicator in these things is kind of kind of the main thing in a lot of ways right if you can figure out why just explain to people why you're doing the thing that you're doing uh and then we'll go from there right because exactly the best way can the fed thread this needle look that's really hard and i'm i think if they would get a lot of sympathy from people not universally if they failed uh trying to let, let manage a soft landing here if they come off slightly to one side or the other inflation stays slightly too high or we get a, or the us gets a kind of shallow recession uh, same goes in the UK um, for the economy here. I think people would kind of think that was a job fairly well done, um, but only if they can get people to understand what they're doing and why they're doing it. So I think, look, at, 
as, as much communication about these things, and that's the same in politics as well, um, as it is kind of getting the decisions bang on in these cases. Hmm. Um, just before we shuffle on, then, Steve, did, did any of the comments in the statement or the, the statement from the Bank of England, did that change your thinking about investing in the new year? And where do rates have to get to, Steve, in, in a savings account for you to have to seriously think about whether money in the market is, is worth being there? I've increasingly come to the thought that um, rates, there isn't a level that rates have to get to uh, in the banking sector for me to think um, that I wouldn't look at equities quite seriously. I mean, it would have to be the case that I, the ratio or the kind of relationship between stocks and returns and uh, banks and returns kind of stays where it is. If share prices come down a lot, I'll buy them with interest rates at 13%. It, you know, it, they need to come down an awful lot more than they currently are in nearly every case. But um, I, I sort of think in this case... It doesn't change much about what I'm thinking. I think next week we're probably uh, going out on April 2nd, so that'll be just before the new ISA season. We'll be talking a fair bit about that, I think, on the way. But I don't think anything's much causing me to uh, think differently here. I'm continuing my policy of trying to put my cash into the best place I can find for it at that given moment. And if I happen to find a better place in the future, well, I'd better find some more cash, basically. Yeah, I'm in the same boat as you are. It doesn't change anything about this. I think if interest rates have to double from here, then uh, it'll only mean cheaper prices for us, which is better for us in the long run. So the only thing we've got to hope for, Steve, is not 30 years of stagnation because of it, but uh, I can't see that happening. And I don't think anybody should invest like that, to be honest. So for me, it, it would be, um, it would just be, Good to have uh, the additional um, the additional rate on my savings. I will always try to get my ISA deposit in full first, uh, get some money in my SIP, and then whatever else left will will benefit from that attractive rate outside the market. And I, I don't think there's anything really that it would get to that would change my mind about that. Yeah, the way I think about it is I've got an emergency fund built out, and I I know you kind of grow your emergency fund because you anticipate having bigger and bigger emergencies in the future, uh, possibly, or just want more protection from them. I don't. I've built it to the, the as far as it's going to go, and I sort of skim the interest and stick that into stocks. There isn't much of it yet, but if it's the case that rates go up, that will just mean that a bit more goes into the uh, markets or whatever I'm investing in as a result of my uh, emergency fund getting me a, a bit more in terms of interest each month, which is nice, and I'll look forward to that happening, I guess. Yeah, it's stopped being an emergency fund for me, really, now. It's just become mm -hmm. like a cash cushion. Uh, I think it's one of Housel's teachings that the bigger the cash cushion, the better you sleep at night, even if your stocks are going, you know, absolutely awful, you know, regardless of your risk profile. And I have found that, that the bigger my emergency fund gets, and it gets bigger every month, 